I'm James Atkins, uh, Chairman of Virtus Finance. We're an emissions trading company based in Budapest, and we deal with about a thousand clients and counterparties in the European Union emission trading scheme. Um, a colleague asked me if I was going to be Greenpeace or an investment banker, um, and um, I'm not going to be either. Um, and the reason is because the emission trading scheme is about aligning the interest of the investment banker with the Greenpeace guy. So it's about bringing the cost of uh, carbon emissions into the economy so that people make decisions based on that cost. Um, that's the theory. Uh, in practice, there are always divergent interests. So one interest is the investor. Um, and what he wants from the uh, emission trading scheme is a clear political signal that there's going to be a steady, consistent carbon price that he can rely on for making his investment decisions. Other investors who perhaps already own fossil fuel-based uh, installations, what they want from the emission trading scheme is a very low carbon price. If you're the operator of a facility, what you want is a very stable price in the short term so that you don't have to be constantly making decisions about what fuel mix to use or what technology to use. If you care for the planet, then you want a very high carbon price so that people are incentivized to uh, move away from polluting technologies and use clean technology. If you're the politician, you want all of that. You want it to be good for everybody, and particularly, you want all the guys who are voting for you. Um, you want factory owners, you want workers to, be, um, to accept the uh, carbon price and the terms of the emission trading scheme. If you're a bureaucrat in Brussels, you want promotion. And um, the most important guy, Joe Public, he doesn't want anything out, out of the emission trading scheme. He just wants to be left in peace. So the story of the emission trading scheme depends on who you are. And like some of the time in the morning with this person and at work with this person and uh, you know, we've got very different interests depending whether we're a dad or a dealer, um, and hopefully the emission trading scheme blends those interests. Kind of does. So what I'm going to do is give a little bit of insight into the emission trading scheme and show how companies are using the instruments of trading um, from the point of view of a treasurer. Just to put it in perspective, we're talking about a um, cap and trade scheme which is aimed at rationing or reducing CO2 emissions in the industrial sector of the EU. It's compulsory to be part of it. About 9,800 companies are covered by the scheme, uh, 13,000 installations in heat production, cement, iron and steel, oil refining, food production, aviation, dozens of industries. About 270 industries are covered by the scheme in total. About 1.9 billion tons of CO2 are covered by the scheme. That's about 45% of the EU's total uh, CO2 emissions. The main instrument of trade in the emission trading scheme is the EU allowance. And one EU allowance represents emissions of one ton of CO2. Um, each year, about uh, 10 billion units are traded in the futures market, the value of about 40, 40 50 billion euros. Um, and at the moment, the value of open positions on the ICE market, which is the principal market, for trading uh, allowances is about 10 billion euros. So it's not insignificant, but it's not like other commodities like steel or power or oil and so forth. But it still has a role. 
Now, allowances come into market in two ways. Some are issued by uh, the authorities to industrial companies in order to, uh, in order to cushion uh, their business against international competition from countries or companies which are not covered by an emission trading scheme. About half the total number of allowances are uh, given for free by governments to industry. The other half are issued on weekly auctions by the EEX, which is the European Energy Exchange, and ICE. About 10 million tons or 10 million units are auctioned uh, each week um, through four or five auctions. Now, economic theory says that the best way to issue allowances into the market is by auction. But political convenience says let's give industry allowances for free so it doesn't hurt them. And obviously, broadly, political convenience wins that argument at the moment. So much so that um, there is a huge surplus in the market which is undermining its effectiveness. Um, we have about 1.9 billion tons of CO2 emissions a year within the scheme. Um, there's a surplus of allowances in the system of about 2 billion units, 2.1 billion. So over the last few years, 2 billion more allowances have been issued into the market than are actually needed by companies for compliance. And that surplus is building up further and further, and by 2020, it's expected to be 4.5 billion. Um, as a result, the carbon price is very low. A large number of companies are holding a surplus. So of our client base, about 480 installations are holding surplus of something like 120 million tons of CO2. On average, that's about over a year, a year and a half's worth of emissions. They've got fully covered as a surplus, and that will take many years, if not more than a decade, to clear away. So unless something happens in the scheme, for a long time, the scheme will be in surplus, and there will be little incentive to uh, cut emissions. So let's look now a little bit at what people do with their emissions allowances, kind of from a treasury or an asset management point of view. So look at companies that don't have any cash at the moment. Um, when the emission trading scheme started, we thought, oh, great, here's a free financial instrument. Um, it's got value, it's liquid, we can use it for raising working capital. In reality, that hasn't happened as much, anything like as much as, as we thought, probably naively. Where we see uh, carbon allowances being used for, for um, funding purposes, that's in Romania, and countries where there's a lot of cash-strapped cash or cash-poor uh, industries. We've seen um, companies selling emissions allowances to finance uh, capital assets. I didn't bring my photo of a helicopter, but one of our clients um, financed a helicopter by selling and then repurchasing uh, EU allowances in the forward market, which wasn't a very good matching of, of maturities. He didn't crash it within a year. Um, we've seen clients using EU allowances to finance their um, fuel purchases for the winter, buying winter fuel. Um, and we've seen them uh, being used as collateral for loans. Um, at the moment, because interest rates are very low, uh, companies can uh, uh, do a repo and um, finance, y use um, allowances for financing at a cost of about just under 2% uh, a year, um, which when there's lots of cash about, that's perhaps more than you'd want to spend, but it's certainly cheaper than raising equity. Um, sometimes you get really exceptional opportunities, and um, in the first half of last year, uh, in another carbon instrument from the Kyoto Protocol, the CER, it was in backwardation, and so people actually made money by borrowing money, which was a very nice situation for them, for those that had their wits about them and could take advantage of it. Um, another way that companies are using to free up capital 
for, from their free allowances is to sell and then buy um, call options to cover their position in the market. Um, that might seem expensive, but a lot of people who know the carbon market for a number of years have seen tremendous drops in price happen. So you can have a day where the price would fall by 20%, one or two euros. So people are very aware that you can get dramatic falls in price and then you feel really stupid that you bought at six when you can buy it for three now. Um, and so that the volatility caused by political purposes, for political reasons, volatility people have experienced makes them very careful about making commitments on price. Um, in, on the question of volatility, this is just an illustration of what was happening last year. Um, this is the volatility, 90 day volatility of the EU allowance. This is German power and Brent. And so it's multiples more volatile. Um, and uh, it's perhaps worth just looking a little bit as why that is. It's mainly driven by political wins. So people have figured out that the system needs reform. And very, very simplistically, there's a political struggle between the right, which believes in business and jobs and competitiveness, and the left, which believes in the future and the human race and the planet. And when the right has the upper hand, the um, uh, carbon price goes down because we expect there will be a relaxed scheme. And when the left has the upper hand, the carbon price can go up because we think there'll be a tight emission trading scheme. Um, but this volatility very locally is also caused by silly comments by MEPs. So you've got a vote coming on the reform of the emission trading scheme. And one MEP sends a tweet and the price goes up 30 cents. And another MEP sends a tweet and the price goes down 50 cents. So kind of um, loose behavior by policymakers uh, adds to the uh, volatility that we see. Now, oh, this was my illustration about labor markets and stuff, but we jumped over that. So what do you do if you've got cash, so you don't need to, to raise any cash? Um, occasionally, opportunities arise. Um, sometimes the instrument goes into like a super contango, and then the banks will recommend that you buy the units now and fix a sale price in the future, and you can make a risk-free return above you know, what you get in the bank. Um, obviously, that doesn't happen that often, but it does happen sometimes. So if you're alert and you're a treasure and you've got a bit of cash, keep your eye on the carbon market, there might be uh, a play like that. If you want to take more risk, you can lend allowances to other, pe other companies. So we've been involved in a lot of deals where a company with who's long on allowances, got plenty of spare allowances, will lend to a company which needs some for compliance purposes. They lend them for compliance. The counterparty uses them for compliance purposes. And then later, when he gets the free allowance back from the government, he can repay the debt in units. And if you're able and prepared to take the credit risk of that borrowing counterparty, you might make 10% in a couple of months, which is reasonable use of an asset which otherwise um, you know, is just sitting there. Because the fact is that most of the companies which are sitting on months and months or years and years worth of free allowances do nothing with them. They just sit there probably not even on the balance sheet because they get them for free, they don't mark to market, they just sit there. A note on hedging practices. So sophisticated companies in the emission trading scheme will buy positions in the carbon market to match the emissions that they've committed to. So if now I'm selling forward electricity for next year, then now I fix the price for my CO2 units for the equivalent amount of carbon that will be emitted 
by the power I sell. But companies smaller than the more sophisticated ones, many do nothing. They're very um, ad hoc. They're very um, emotional about their practices um, uh, to do with hedging. We're just about to start a study, a survey with the London School of Economics to look at factually how the hinterland of SMEs and medium-sized companies um, actually do hedging in the emission trading scheme. And um, we're curious to see what the facts are um, as opposed to the uh, assumptions. Um, there is an investment case for EU allowances, but you have to be careful about it. Um, there's a general view that the units can go up much more than they can go down. So EU allowances today are about six euros. They've gone up a little bit, six euros. Um, they could be 30 euros. And the view that they could be 30 euros is kind of based on a historical narrative that they were once 30 euros, so we know what the world is like when they were 30 euros. But that was like eight years ago. Um, and actually, nothing like really happened. The world didn't fall apart. So that we know at a price of 30 euros, you know, things will chug along. So that's the upside. You know, the downside is if things go tits up again, then the worst can be the price is zero. But one thing always keeps the price away from zero, that's that you can use these allowances indefinitely. So they don't expire. You can use them in this trading phase up to 2020, but you can carry them forward to the next decade. So they're a bit like an option in that sense, but they're not going to expire. So your downside is always going to be limited because of that. Like, one day they will when the scheme is wound up, but that's like you know, 2050 or whatever. So the case that the price is going to go up sometime seems quite strong. You know, the planet Earth is getting warmer. And people know that, and politicians know that, and even business people know that, and there's a kind of assumption that therefore the rules will get tighter and the emission trading scheme will get tighter, and therefore the price will go up. Um, but there's a slip in the thinking there, and it won't necessarily go up even if the scheme gets tighter, and that is because there are lots of other factors which can push down demand for EU allowances, and those are factors which are completely independent of the emission trading scheme. So first there's legislation which is reducing demand for EU allowances, for example the Large Combustion Plant Directive and the Industrial Emissions Directive is forcibly causing coal-fired power plants to shut down. So like um, in the UK, eight gigawatts of coal-fired power has elected to shut down rather than comply with the uh, uh, Industrial Emissions Directive. That's eight gigawatts out of 25. It's a big chunk. And therefore, demand for EU allowances will fall quite independently of the emission trading scheme. Secondly is the promotion of renewable energy in Europe, which is driven by... Uh, renewable uh, subsidies and uh, feed-in tariff schemes, again, independent of the ETS. And very substantial quantities of renewable energy or renewable capacity are being installed every year, and gradually that is wearing away at demand for fossil fuel power. Third thing is economic decline. You know, the best way to cut CO2 emissions is to have a recession as was proved between, you know, after uh, 2008. You don't need any policy, you just need a bad economy and your emissions go down. And the, the fourth thing which um, causes um, uh, allowances or demand for allowances to fall independently of the price is the expectation of price. So investors are making decisions about 
um, assets, about uh, energy uh, intensive assets, which are going to last for 40 to 50 years. So they're not interested in the carbon price today, they're interested in the expectation of there being a high carbon price in the future. But if their actions are always anticipating the price, then there'll actually never be demand for CO2 that would push the price up. So you can easily have a stable system which is tight, but the price is quite low. And that is something that isn't appreciated politically, really. They think, a lot of people think, oh, price is down, schemes bust, we're emitting too much CO2. If we were emitting too much CO2, the price would be really high because we'd be struggling to comply. So the very low price in the CO2 market, six euros, when I say low, that means it's lower than we think it should be. Um, that has caused the European Commission to say, right, we're going to reform this system. Um, and in January, they launched a package called the um, Climate and Energy Package or Proposal, um, a bunch of different um, uh, policy measures or policy proposals to uh, cut Europe's dependence on energy uh, and um, improve energy security and to cut emissions. Um, the aim of the package is to be consistent with the 2050 goal of getting CO2 emissions to about 10% of what they were in uh, 1990. They want to make, um, to bring emissions in the sectors covered by the emission trading scheme to be to fall 43% compared with the 2005 level. So by 2020, we've got a target of 20%. We're going to have to do another 23% in the following 10 years. Um, and so the hope is that if this package is approved, then the EU allowance price will go up and the emission trading scheme will be a driver of of change rather than just a follower of change as it is today. So that was a short um, overview of the emission trading scheme, giving a little insight into how people are dealing with the uh, allowances from an asset management or treasury point of view. In short, it is a market, it's a functioning and liquid market, um, but it's a political market, it's an artifice created by politicians and it is very very sensitive and therefore very volatile to un political uncertainty um, and political change so you may well want to apply your cash to that market to make an extra turn but do it with great vigilance and care thank you